Now take your little munchkin voice and go away. Shoo, 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 shoo. Listen up! This is the proper procedure for administering oxygen. You place the mask securely about the face of the patient and then have them breathe deeply. Now that is the way it's done in Captain Harris's precinct. What the hell? Hey, welcome to Trimming the Movie Fat, the podcast where we trim films from franchises that don't belong. I'm Stephen Nicholson. And I'm Paul Nicholson. And thank you for coming back for our second and final look at the Police Academy movie series. In episode one, we looked at Police Academy 1 to 3, which, well, having watched all seven now, I would say are the glory years. So today we're going to focus in on 4 to, to 7. And let's kick things off with Police Academy 4. Those talented graduates are back in Police Academy 4! I want to welcome all of you to Citizens on Patrol. Citizens on Patrol. The Police Academy has offered to train you citizens. You just don't think I'm fast enough anymore, do you? to better protect yourselves. Do we get to pack heat? Attention all cars, attention all cars. Mahoney. Gee, I love saying that. Jones. Ah! Hightower. <laughs> Sweet Chuck. Zed. And Tackleberry. Please! Good idea. From now on, by land. Man, you have the right to remain silent. Who's gonna save me? By sea. Or by air, there's no escaping justice. Gentlemen, may I see your license and registration, please? I can blast them out of the sky, sir. No, I can't. I should give them a warning shot first. Police Academy 4, Citizens on Patrol. Now be careful, because a 44 Magnum has quite a <laughs> kick. See it in your neighborhood while you still have one. In this movie, we... We do the citizens on patrol. This time we teach the citizens how to police themselves. Yeah. And uh, this time uh, we're, we're all sort of involved with Mahoney taking care of these two kids that get into trouble with skateboards because we were such troublemakers in the beginning of the film. They all knew each other. They knew their strengths and weaknesses. And what you had to do was kind of guide them to not only give you what was on the page, but perhaps in an inspired way to come up with something new. And so what I tried to do was just be open to anything they might do, and uh, Bobcat Goldthwait was very good at improv. And most of these have had, even though people like Bubba came out of a football background, many of them have studied improvisational acting, so all you really had to do was steer them in the right direction, and they would add on top of that little extra bits that if you kept the camera rolling long enough, you might be the recipient of something extra. So Police Academy 4, Citizens on Patrol, was released in 1987, and it was directed by Jim Drake. So the plot for this one, Feeling that his squad is not up to snuff, a police commander comes up with an unorthodox plan to hire everyday citizens to work alongside police officers. Unruly Sergeant Kerry Mulhoney, played by Steve Gutenberg, is given the job of training the citizens. At first, Mulhoney does not take the job seriously, but when he learns that his nemesis, Captain Harris, played by G.W. Bailey, is gunning for his commander's job, Mahoney focuses on making the plan work and bringing down Harris at the same time. So the gross for this movie, um, it grows 78 million US dollars on a budget of 17 million. So it made over four times its budget and it was the 42nd highest grossing movie of 1987. And if you're looking for a movie mistake in Police Academy 4, uh, have a look at the official poster for it, which depicts Michael Winslow with a moustache despite him not having one in this film uh, and actually uh, made the same mistake again in the Police Academy 5 poster. So ratings wise it has a 0% fresh Rotten Tomatoes score, a 38 Rotten Tomatoes audience score 
a 5 out of 10 IMDb audience rating and a 26 out of 100 IMDb critic metascore. And here's a fact for you. Uh, the collapse of her first marriage contributed to Sharon Stone's decision to work on this movie. Um, of wanting to have some fun after having a difficult period in her life, she said that hanging out with a gang of comedians it was the best therapy. And in summary, with the exception of Mission to Moscow, this film is high in the running to become the worst movie in the franchise. Steve Gutenberg's swan song from the series, and who can blame him? So, Paul, we've uh, rewatched Police Academy 1 through 7. We're at number 4. What do you think of the movie, and do you remember when you first seen it? Yeah, we first seen it, or saw it at when it came out in the 87 and it was almost like a tradition wasn't it I remember liking it at the time but it was hard to distinguish the difference between the films at the time and but when you watch it now it's possibly the worst in the franchise it's just just really poor not a good film at all everything about it's just dated as well it's so so what makes this a step down compared to, say, even the previous one? The last one was okay, but when they're on, I don't know, when they're on the boats and stuff like that, the chase at the end of the third one, and you're getting to see, like, Zed train as a police officer, and whereas in this one it's kind of like, it doesn't know what it wants to do, if it wants to go back to the original ones or be different, and I think it's just in between, and it just doesn't doesn't work. I do what I do think is quite clever, Citizens on Patrol how it's like an acronym for COP. I think that's quite clever. But what funny moments do you, you do you recall from it? Zed and his girlfriend in the, the Blow Monkeys plays and he's with the girlfriend and stuff. I think that bit's good. And maybe the funniest bit's when Hightower, like the young recruits are kind of mucking around so they that will teach them a lesson. So Hightower uh, pretends that he's been goes in that body bag, and so they think they're on a case. But it's all been set up by the senior police officers, and then Hightower dressed as like a Rastafarian guy comes out with a chainsaw. That that was quite clever. That yeah, I mean, I think for me the the. It starts off badly with the awful kind of rap theme tune at the beginning, which which is really, really bad. Um, I think uh, strange kind of seeing Sharon Stone and David Spade in it, obviously before mm -hmm. they became uh, bigger stars. Uh, I was glad to see Captain Harris back, because that was one of the positives mm -hmm. uh, in the movie. And I think actually... Uh, he gets the first laugh in the movie when when he's when he says, you know, don't play with my balls. Don't touch those! Don't you ever touch my balls without asking? I remember, <laughs> actually, vividly remember seeing that in the cinema and just crying, <laughs> laughing. Um, yeah, uh, it was also good getting to see the Kirkland family uh, back punching each other, mm -hmm. uh, which is always yeah. amusing. Um, I'm watching it. I'm, I'm guessing the, the likes of uh, skateboards and doing tricks on your BMX were the in thing around the time because we've got extended montage sequences, especially the skateboard and one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Most of the humor doesn't hit. It's really tired and predictable. Uh, I mean, I, I did find it funny, but you know, Callahan. Uh, I will play the drowning victim now. Who's going yeah, to save me? And all the guys great. jump in to save her. Mm. I'll say Callahan with you know the, the, the big boobs and the wet top. But again, it's just a variation on the gag from the first movie when she's demonstrating, mm. uh, you know, uh, fighting. It's mm. like right, who wants to be next? And they're all yeah, me, me. So it's just a variation on that. I will play the drowning victim. Arnie. Save 
me. Oh, yeah. Good to see the blue oyster bar back with Harrison Proctor going visit it. That'd be the last time as well, yeah. Good to see that. I think it was, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I did laugh when, uh, which is actually quite a good sequence, the air stuff at the end, the hot air balloon yeah, in the airplanes good. is actually pretty good. Um, but I did laugh at Proctor when he says, right, I'll give them a warning shot, sir, when he's in the hot air balloon <laughs> <laughs> and shoots his own balloon. Yeah, because he shoots up in there. Uh, and actually, talk, going back to the skateboard and stuff, uh, did you recognize Tony yeah, Hawk as one of the yeah. skateboarders? yeah. I didn't realise that at the time. Yeah, so the world's most famous. Mm. Yeah, obviously the world's most famous skateboarder. Yeah, so obviously he's a, a teenager or young, young, young man in that. Um, and and oh, another thing that uh, I thought of the awful Brian Wilson song at the end was it? Let's go yeah. to heaven in my car. Is it the song? Oh, rubbish. So no, this this is a, a a decline in quality, even over the previous movie, which in itself was you know decent enough, uh, but this is obviously uh, not as good. So where would you rank it, Paul? Uh, top, middle, or lower tier police academy? Lower tier. Yeah, I would also go lower tier. They're back. Come on in, register. Jones. <laughs> Hightower! Hey. Hooks! Back off, you turkey! Callahan! Eyes left! House! Why, this old baby, it doesn't even break, it pulverizes! Tackleberry! Proctor! <laughs> Harris! <laughs> and Commandant Lizard! Their assignment? <laughs> Miami Beach! <laughs> and they're beside themselves with excitement! Get ready for Eric! This time, instead of making arrests, they're going to take one. He's thinking. But when ruthless criminals kidnap Lassard, his loyal force put their vacation on hold and become bent on revenge. Once they spring into action, man for man, tan for tan, oh, dork. they're the hottest force on the serpent sand. And they'll do whatever it takes, Stop. no matter how much it hurts. Stop. Stop. Help! Police Academy 5. Leave the swimming area now, mister! It's the best in fun and guns under the sun. It was a big show, you know, before its day. This was long before CGI, you know, before computer graphics, uh, before uh, steady cams were particularly well known. We, you know, the, the tools, the, the technical tools of filmmaking were... Uh, are, are far more sophisticated now than they were then. Come on, show me what you got. I'm open, I'm open. But for its day, uh, it was as ambitious a production as uh, virtually any other movie that, we, that came out in that period of time. It was short of a James Bond movie, which had you know a far larger budget. Okay, so let's move on to Police Academy 5, Assignment Miami Beach, released in 1988 and directed by Alan Meyerson. So the plot for this one... Uh, is there a plot? Um, oh, there is. Uh, the, the police academy's commandant will be on, honoured at the police convention in Miami Beach. At the airport, he picks a wrong bag with stolen diamonds, and the owners want them back. That's about it. So the budget, uh, well, this grossed 54.5 million US dollars on a budget of 14. Um, so it made almost three and a half times its budget, and it was the 53rd highest grossing movie of 1988. And if you're looking for a movie mistake, it's, and this one's around the 36 minute mark, during the shark attack rescue scene, Tackleberry's gun is pointed at the shark's head sticking out of the water, the gun visibly above sea level. However, in the next shot, Tackleberry's gun and the shark are now underwater. So I'm guessing the, that sea water is not going to be too good for Tackleberry's gun, if you'll pardon the expression. So ratings wise, <clears throat> we have another 0% Rotten Tomatoes score, a 33% uh, Rotten Tomatoes audience score, a 4.6 out of 10 IMDb audience rating, and an 18 out of 100 critic meta score on IMDb. 
And here's a fact for you. So when Police Academy 4 was released, a Serbic critic Rex Reed swore, if they make another Police Academy movie, I'll leave the business. At the time, Paul Maslanke said, Reed's one of the reasons I'm making Police Academy 5. I expect him to be a man of his word. To Maslanke's disappointment, Reed was not. So in summary, as per Rotten Tomatoes, while I welcome the new approach of the film being set in Miami, it does not disguise the feeling that the series has now become tired and feels like it's ran its course. So had it run its course for you, Paul? Okay, I quite like it. I, I don't know, just I do, I do like that it's going on a different approach, you know, from the, the city and being at the academy there. You know they're all going to a, a different location. Obviously, Miami is beautiful, and the beach scene. So I just think it brings a new dynamic. It brings a wee bit of life into into the franchise after four. But it's still kind of slapstick, really, isn't it? It's it's uh, it's becoming more like Carry On films. But I do love the the. Where it's set like Miami, just and it's almost like they're all on holiday together. So it's almost like a holiday version of them on holiday together. And I think it's a good, good thing to do. And uh, it's much, much better than four. But still, that's not saying much. But uh, any any funny moments stand out for you? Maybe when Harris has to try to chat up the women in the. In the bar, and he's like, <laughs> he's just like making a fool of himself, and he's trying to be cool and everything. I mean, the special effects are quite poor <laughs> when his hat's on fire. You can, uh, but it's quite funny just thinking he's going to. He goes, "Hello, ladies," and he's all like that, <laughs> as if they're going to do. Really, uh, so, so that was, I like that, but that was that was that was funny. Suntan today too. too. <laughs> That's nice. Maybe you'd like to come up to my room later and uh, put a little lotion on it. <laughs> no? Oh, look at these cute friends. What is your name, little girl? What the hell are you doing? Blowing in my ear? No, sir, I... I, I... Scram! But, but... Hey! My, my name is uh, Thaddeus hey! Harris. Maybe you've heard of me. Not really. Ah! coming up to my room is out of the question yeah for me this this movie uh, there's no Steve Gutenberg so there's no Mahoney and it feels like a circus without his ringmaster um, so I think he's sadly missed in this and I think the first laugh in the movie or the first time I laughed in the movie was when one of the police academy graduates trips up and falls in Elisard's crotch which is mm-hmm. quite, quite amusing. I think it's, mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, mm-hmm. That's good. But I, I found, again, a lot of the humour just very groan-inducing. Uh, like, for example, the golf balls falling out of Lassard's bag at the, the airport. Uh, and I, I think you know the humour has become very young. It's become very cartoonish, just with you know sil- people, adults doing silly things, pratfalls. And I don't know if a lot of that was to do with that these movies were liked by kids and there was a Police Academy cartoon and everything. So I don't know if that was a deliberate thing to be more uh, kind of play play to that audience. Uh, although talking to kids, I did like the bad guy uh, crushing the kid's toy at the airport oh, yeah. at the foot of the escalator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite good. He's got that laugh. Um, and, you know, I actually liked him in it. He, he was yeah, actually he was uh, someone I really enjoyed, the main bad guy. And he he was very good. I think especially as he gets more exasperated at uh, Lassard. Yeah. Because you know, he keeps <laughs> avoiding all their schemes to get the bag back. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think the Tackleberry versus Shark thing was quite funny. But again, it's just, that's a, uh, it's like the, one of those things that's just repeated in each movie with a slight variation. Uh, and oh, I think Harris getting dork on his oh, front, yeah. the suntan lotion Hello, on the dork. beach is funny. Hello, dork. Hey, what's up? 
coming, dork. <laughs> hey, dork. Hey, dork. Hey, dork. <laughs> Yeah, that that is good. And Harris is, I think Harris actually is probably the main one for laughs in this when he gets his cheap flight to Miami when oh, he's boasting business. that he's got his own private plane to fly down. Yeah, and boasting to everybody. And yeah, just as an absolute wreck. Ah, oh, Commandant Lassard. I was very sorry to learn that we wouldn't be traveling together. Now that is a disappointment. <laughs> Uh, Lieutenant Proctor has booked us on a very special flight. Oh. VIP, excuse me. <laughs> VIP. Uh, I understand that you're taking an economy flight? We'll just have to meet in Miami. I'll see you there. Miss, uh, could you please tell me uh, at what gate flight 1545 is boarding? Gate 24, sir. Uh -huh. Could you also check and make sure that I am in the special VIP section? The name is Harris. There is no VIP section, sir. It's a private plane. Ah, oh, a private plane. And you and Mr. Proctor are the only listed passengers. Oh, I see. Our own plane. Well, well, Harris. You travel first class, I must say. Well, it's the only way. Come, Proctor. This is great. Our own airplane. Animals to play with. I'll tell you, this VIP treatment is worth every penny. <laughs> hey, okay. <laughs> Doctor, Doctor, why do I put up with you? Uh, well, sir, ah. I think that's because my sister married your nephew, and well, that makes us shut up, Doctor. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you were talking about the bar, the the bar. Uh, mm -hmm. scene with Harris, but that, that was one, another thing that came through about unwanted sexual advances to women. <laughs> mm. Yeah. It's, it just... it's just like uh, the, the kind of Mahoney replacement as well, going up to the girl by the pool. Yeah, he just goes up and puts like suntan lotion on her back. The the hotel, you, you'll know this, was the hotel in it the same one that's in the Bond movie Goldfinger? Yeah, La Fontainebleau. Yeah, La Fontainebleau. yeah, I thought so. Um, but I think the, the the thing that gave the biggest laugh in this film was uh, Lassard not knowing that he's actually been kidnapped for real. Yeah. And he keeps giving the kidnappers ideas about, well, you should ask, you should ask for a helicopter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hell, and man. they're and they're loving them. He thinks he's great. Yeah, and the guy, yeah. and the big boss guy, you know, mafioso, was like, now you need to kill them both. And they're, wow, they don't want to kill Lassard. He went. Well, we'll kill that guy, Harris. No mm. problem, but let's have because mm. I like him. Mm. <laughs> so that was good. That was good. Um, I was just going to say, did you like another bit before we go on that I liked was when they're going up in the lift or the elevator and they're going up and one of them fires <laughs> and they're all like that, looking round. What's the matter? You got a problem with this floor? I don't mean to interfere, but the commissioners are all downstairs. I would use the penthouse. It's very defensible. <laughs> You're all welcome to use my suite. Allow me. Remember that bit there in the lift. See, I, I, I do. But, uh, I didn't, I didn't laugh at that because it was just a, it was t uh, ripped off from uh, one of the Pink Panther movies where they'd done it, and was it was it? funnier. Or, yeah, uh, and actually, the outtake was the, out, the outtakes were funnier because they all kept laughing for real. Mm. In it, uh, if you actually, uh, if you'll find it on YouTube, yeah, it's out, outtakes and like uh, Peter Sellers in there with the actors and. And there's that to go right action, then it'll be, <laughs> and you can see them, you know, and they're trying to keep a straight face, and they'll just fall about laughing. Uh, so no, I didn't laugh because uh, the outtakes from the Pink Panther one are a hundred mm. times more funnier. <laughs> People try not to laugh. Yeah, yeah. So where would you rank this one, Paul? Probably middle.
I would uh, stick it in lower. I, I actually probably prefer the fourth one, yeah, over this over this one. Um, but there's not much between it. I'll be honest. <laughs> An evil crime lord is getting inside information. We've suspected that there was a leak in this precinct. It could be anyone. Making us look like a bunch of fools. Now, Matt. Hightower. <laughs> Hooks. You can pick it up at the police impound yard. Boy! Callahan. <laughs> yeah. Tackleberry. You'll take the bus and like it now, mister. Jones. <laughs> Target human. Backler. Or Commandant Lazard. I know we shall soon triumph over our enemies. They love their work. Yeah! Yeah, help me! How's the homeless? And it shows. Woo! <laughs> when it comes to in flight yeah! service <laughs> and on the job safety. I have just the men for the job. The biggest wheels around. That was very exciting, wasn't it? Police Academy 6, City Under Siege. How do, how do you make Police Academy 6 different from 54321? To keep the characters doing what they do in a new way. <laughs> you, don't work, uh, you, you don't work with them, you just try to tap into what their magic is. My, my task was Police Academy 6, and one realizes that when a uh, film series gets to 6, there must be some incredible magnetism and dynamic uh, involving the cast. So you, you uh, sit and, and watch the other films and try to figure out what that is. I went to see Police Academy 6 on a Saturday matinee with a lot of little kids in the audience, and about halfway through the movie, I began to feel a certain nostalgia. I realized I was remembering the Saturday afternoons when I was a kid and I used to go to the Bowery Boys or Abbott and Costello movies. The Police Academy movies are sort of in the same tradition, dumb but cheerfully dumb with a lot of goofy slapstick and silly sight gags. They're aimed at a young audience, they're made for a young audience, in their own way they succeed in creating dim-witted comedy in the Bowery Boys tradition. It's just that I'm not one of those little kids anymore. This movie is not made to be seen by or maybe even to be reviewed by adults. Well, I can only tell you, uh, I won't review the audience, except to say that um, I saw it late night and there were adults in the theater. Um, looking at the picture, I was astonished as I have been throughout the series at just how stupid the films are. Um, I don't think they're as good as Abbott and Costello, but I, I, I just no, 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 I, I, I just don't laugh. I, I, I think they're kind of cheap. Um, I think that they hold shots that are hold them far too long where they should be. I suppose maybe they're waiting for a laugh. I don't find it myself filling it with laughs. Uh, this movie came out, the first one came out the same time as The Right Stuff. I thought The Right Stuff was going to be a smash hit, and uh, I've always associated the Police Academy series with The Right Stuff. They came out at the, roughly the same time. This one went to the moon. Right Stuff didn't. Yeah. And uh, well, I was I, just I, trying to, I'm just trying to categorize this movie, kind of a generic approach to film criticism. Sure, none of them are as good as Abbott and Costello, but they're kind of on the level of the Bowery Boys. And one footnote that we have to put in here. On this show, we have constantly over the years referred to the fruit cart scene, the obligatory scene in a chase where the car races onto the sidewalk and knocks over a fruit stand and races away, and the fruit vendor is shaking his head at the departing car. In this scene, there is a tribute to our criticism. There's Gene and Roger's fruit stand and the big, uh, enormous, big, big foot truck with a 20-foot wheels does not run over it. And for that, I suppose, I suppose we're supposed to be grateful, but you know, not really that grateful. I don't know how you feel, but... I wasn't grateful. Um, I mean, it was amusing, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's about the only smile I had in the whole film. Now... So yeah, let's move on to Police Academy 6, which is City Under Siege, released in 1989 and directed by Peter Bonertz. So, plot for this one. After the high-speed adventure in Police Academy 5, a spate of robberies in the stylish Wilson Heights district terrorises the city. Then, to make matters worse, when the trio of cat burglars manage to pull off a daring heist right under the nose of Captain Harris, it is up to Commandant Lassard and a band of loyal graduates from the Police Academy, the original Police Academy, to stop the wave of thefts. So this one, the gross has dropped to 33 million 
US dollars worldwide uh, on a budget of 15 million. So it made almost two times its budget. So we're, we're seeing a, a very steady mm. decline with each movie here. And it was the 78th highest grossing movie of 1989. And if you're looking for a movie mistake, at around 29 minutes, when Proctor tries to pull Harris back up into the window washing compartment, Harris grabs onto Pro Proctor's trouser leg. In one, one shot, you can see Proctor already down to his boxers before the trouser rip actually happens. So, uh, talking of consistency, ratings wise, it's uh, another 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, 28% uh, Rotten Tomatoes audience score, 4.4 4 out of 10 IMDb audience rating and a 16 out of 100 critic meta score on IMDb. And a fact for you, throughout the film, the mayor constantly forgets his words and stumbles over his lines. This was not in the script, but a character trait uh, improvised by Kenneth Mars, which uh, God bless him, because that always made me laugh when he kept mm -hmm. forgetting his, mm -hmm. um, his words. That was great. And in summary, this feels like a slight return to form made in the style of the earlier movies. And after releasing a sequel every year since 1984, it's a good way to bow out. Unless we include the debacle five years later that is Mission to Moscow. All right, so I'll maybe kick us off on, on this one, Paul. So I haven't watched Police Academy 6 in a long, 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 long time. And I, we, again, it was another one we've seen at the cinema, as other than the first one and the last mm. one we've seen them all at the cinema. Uh, and this is one that I remember back in 1989 being a return to form and being really, really funny. Um, and if my memory served me, I always thought this was the best one after one and two. Uh, so I, I rewatched it. And I am totally wrong. It really isn't. Um, this this was the most disappointing one for me on rewatching. Mm -hmm. So I always remember this being really funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the mayor's funny in it, mm -hmm. forgetting his lines. Um, I think you get a laugh when um, from from uh, Harris again when Lassard returns <laughs> to work with him after mm -hmm. trying to get away from Lassard. That's uh, really good. Uh, I did laugh at Taco Buddy's house, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> minefield and barbed wire around, and his son's got a weapon as well. Uh, but uh, what's his name? Sergeant Fackler. He returns yeah. in this movie. You know, the one that's really clumsy. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, it's just eye rollingly unfunny. Mm -hmm. You know, he obviously bangs into people, knocks stuff over. It's just not for me anyway. Not funny. Um, and a lot of the humour in this one just really falls flat for me, uh, uninspired. Uh, although it is funny when Lassard uh, hustles the, the the criminal at the pool table. Mm -hmm. That's quite good uh, in there. But yeah, I, I thought this was a, a bad movie. Uh, really, really disappointing. What do you think? Yeah, it's most because remember buying the VHS video, I think in Jersey, my video a couple of years later after it was made and used to watch it quite a bit but it's it's just run out of steam by then isn't it it's it's uh, Fackler or maybe funny in the earlier films but this one it is it's just like slapstick but bad slapstick like I was saying there you can tell when you think about they've released a new movie every year since 1984 at that point and you can just see it's like really tired now. I did like was when Harris was doing Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, not Harris. Jones. <laughs> Harris doing Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jones doing Jimi Hendrix. Good. That was good. That, was good yeah. that bit was good, in it? Good to see him with his moustache back as well, because his moustache had four and five. So his moustache back. But yeah, I mean, it's it's like I mean, you're talking some of the characters have, have just been played out, they've become annoying. It's like Zed for me mm -hmm. in Police Academy Four, where Zed is maybe the best character in Police Academy Two, right? Mm -hmm. He's really funny. Then he obviously joins Police Academy in the third one. Okay, so there's, there's humour in that. Then by the fourth one, for me, he's just actually annoying, mm -hmm. which is a shame because yeah, he just 
too too much of a good thing sometimes, and something just the character can get played out. So, so where would you rank this one? I'm gonna go bottom actually. <laughs> Bottom. Yeah, I'd go lower tier as well. <laughs> tier um, for me, sadly. After half a century of opposition, the two largest world powers have finally begun working together. But now, just when we thought the Cold War was over, leave it to these guys to heat it up again. May I kiss you again? No, you may not. Police Academy, mission to Moscow. To kick many, many Buskies. Those fearless five from the force are together again on a mission of peace and understanding. <laughs> because the Academy's finest will stop at nothing. Americanski police. When it comes to fighting crime. Do we have proof? <laughs> Do we have proof? They're not sitting down on the job. They're not being taken for a ride. And when it's time to use force, excess is best. They're about to show Russia just how ugly Americans can get. The Cold War may be over, but give them time. They just got here. Police Academy, mission to Moscow. We are in deep force. It turned out to be a, a, a terrific event for a lot of people involved, a shooting event, because it was the first comedy that was um, made in now Russia, uh, which involved American cast, American director, American producer, and it was a collaboration, a, a wonderful collaboration with the Russians in making that movie. We all came away with some amazing experiences okay let's move on to the final movie and it's uh <laughs> what a beauty it is it's police academy mission to moscow released in 1994 and directed by alan metter and the plot for this one the the russian government hires the veterans of police academy to help deal with the mafia and that's it uh, so the gross for this one it made a massive 1.6 million dollars worldwide on a budget of 10 which means it lost almost six times its budget so a big flop and it was the the, the, the film was the first in the franchise to not make the top 100 grossing movies list on the year of release so every sequel up to this point in the franchise has taken less at the box office than its predecessor so, movie mistake, well, I think the entire movie is a mistake, but anyway, at one hour, four minutes, when Callahan is kidnapped, Cadet Connors is on the roof of the car, the windows change from almost closed to fully open between shots. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll say more than that, uh, Paul, if a lot of the stuff, uh, when they're filming in Moscow, uh, the car stuff, it's actually a nice, clear, sunny blue mm. sky. Uh, but when it cuts to the close-up, it's uh, obviously at the studio and it's a grey backdrop yeah. on it mm -hmm. uh, which kind of takes you out of it uh, but ratings wise zero percent again on rotten tomatoes 22 percent rotten tomatoes audience score three and a half out of 10 imdb audience rating and 11 out of 100 critic meta score on imdb so a fact for you uh, this is the only movie not to feature bubba smith as hightower marion ramsey as hooks uh, or George R. Robertson as Hearst. And in summary, the only film in the franchise not to use the number of sequel in the title, uh, and it really stands out as weak and cringeworthy. Despite the film's many flaws, it does possess a good cast of old and new upcoming actors. Sadly, they cannot save this turkey. So Paul, talk about the turkey. Is this the worst Police Academy movie? Without a doubt. Uh, it's funny because it was one like all the other ones we'd seen in the cinema at the time, but this I remember seeing until maybe a couple of years later on video or on Sky or something. And because it was only in the cinema for like less than a week because it was that poor. And it's also like five years after the last one as well. And it just, yeah, the, the acting, I mean, not, not so much the, act, the actors are doing the best with what they're given, but. Just a, 
yeah, just really one step too far. Terrible film, but but good good, like I say, good actors in it. I would say the whole thing, uh, can, I think, can just be best described as half-assed. It's like nobody could be bothered, really. Um, I mean, I think Bubba Smith and Marion Ramsey were wise not to to return. Uh, you, I mean, you've got. I mean, I I only seen this for the first time um, this week, so I've never ever watched it. Um, never had the inclination to do so because I remember at the time it just got hated upon, and uh, anyone who did see it. Um, just said it was terrible. So, but I had to watch it because we we're doing this, and I'm glad I've now ticked it off the list. <laughs> but it's it's awful. I um, mean, you've got Christopher Lee and Ron Perlman slumming it uh, in there. Uh, I mean, and yeah, and uh, do you know what? I don't think I actually laughed at all in this movie till 25 minutes in or something. But maybe when Lassard goes into the funeral car by mistake with family. Mm. And that's quite mm. amusing. Yeah. The sword with the, the Russian family. Mm-hmm. And I, I do like that actually it was filmed, uh, a lot of it was filmed in uh, in Moscow, which was good. Uh, I think Claire Forlani, who I think later appeared with Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery in The Rock. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, very pleasing on the eye as a, the translator. But yeah, I mean, but the cast look like they're going through the motions. Uh, the humour just doesn't land at all. It's just not funny. The plot, it's like, what? It's like, I'm, I'm watching it, I'm like, I, what am I meant to care about here? It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, one of the things there, they had Harris doing ballet. It just seemed desperate. Mm. Uh, the new con, the guy, new character Connor, is just a complete drip. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll be honest, if if I if I hadn't been watching it because we were doing this show, I would not have made it to the end. I would have turned it off because there was just nothing, nothing to keep you from watching it. It's pointless. Just a comedy that isn't funny, terrible, mm-hmm. and quite rightly deserves its reputation as being a, a terrible movie. Let's rank it. Uh, well, obvious for me, I'm going uh, lower tier. Lower than the lower tier. Yeah, minus minus lower tier. Yeah, um, and it is a real shame. Well, uh, the thing is, the the, the 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 three movies prior to this weren't all that great either. So it's um, so let's rank the movies, Paul, all seven. In order of preference, and and try and decide which should just be cut from history. Uh, for me, it, it would actually just be in reverse release order. So mm. uh, seven down to three, uh, and I would just fl- flip around the first two. Uh, I think the second movie is funnier than the the, the first one. Um, so yeah, just reverse order of release. Flip around one and two. Uh, number two is my favourite. Uh, so which would you cut from the franchise if you could uh, jump in the time machine and stop them from happening? And maybe well, the ones like first three and time at Miami Beach. Yeah, I mean, I, I think really the only ones that are worthy of people's time are the first two. Um, but the third one's okay. So I, w- I would maybe get rid of uh, everything after the fourth one and just make it a, a trilogy. And actually, if it was that, then it'd be a, a really you know, funny, solid uh, comedy um, trilogy. Mm. Um, and that, that's the way it should have remained. Yep. Okay, well, that's Police Academy covered. We now need to start thinking about our next, uh, our next episode. Have you got any thoughts? What about the Omen? <laughs> Omen mm. films. Mm-hmm. Not yep. the remakes, the original. Uh, well, yeah, the original. Well, uh, I suppose you should explain. So there, there were three original movies, and then they made a TV sequel, a fourth one, 
years later, which uh, I actually own. So I bought the the digital box set, which includes that fourth one, which I've never watched. Uh, I've seen some of it on TV and it was terrible. So, I've, uh, so I own it, but I've never watched it. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's include it because uh, it'll. Mm-hmm. It's only it's the only reason I'll ever watch it. <laughs> so so, uh, but yeah, won't include the remake. Uh, and there was a new one just out, which I believe yeah. is just meant to be all right. Um, so that, so maybe we'll, we'll include that as well, will we? The that's a prequel, isn't it? Okay, so let's include the new one, the TV sequel, and the original three movies. Yeah. yeah okay. Let's do that. So, uh, thank you for watching and, and listening. If uh, you want to tell us what you think of the Police Academy movies, please get in touch. You'll find our uh, email address and such like in the episode description. And do come back next month for our look at the, the Omen movies. And yeah, uh, I know that certainly one of them is going to get a, a doing. That's for sure. Uh, but... Yeah, a couple of really good movies in the in that in that series. So look forward to to rewatching them prior to to talking about them. So uh, come back to us for that. Until then, keep trimming. Trimming the movie fat is a Stephen and Paul Nicholson production. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us by voicemail via the Spotify link in the episode description. You can email us at trimmingthemusicfat at gmail.com. Keep up to date with the show and access exclusive content by joining our Facebook group, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on TikTok. You can also check out our website at trimmingthemusicalfat.com. Thanks for listening.